Putin's war has local consequences. We now know that the war in Ukraine has progressed to a new phase. The most significant incursions into Russia since the full scale war began took place in the weeks leading up to the long anticipated counter offensive by the Ukrainian armed forces, which took place in Moscow and the Belgorod region, near the border with Ukraine. Villages were overrun and hostages taken in the Belgorod region by armed units. On 3 May, Moscow police shot down two drones that were flying over the Kremlin. About four weeks later, eight unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, crashed into suburban homes on the outskirts of the city. Drones have since been spotted in the Russian regions of Kursk and Voronezh. There has been a lot of coverage in Western media suggesting that these attacks in the heart of Russia will cause people to lose faith in the war effort. This is not right. Policymakers and Russian dissidents, among others, who offer frequent or professional commentary on the Russian Ukrainian conflict often portray it as the work of a single, maniacal dictator. It is Putin's war, they say, and ordinary Russians aren't to blame because they aren't killing Ukrainians. If someone else were in charge of Russia instead of Putin, peace might be possible. It's also true that Russia is a totalitarian state where citizens have almost no say in government and where even the slightest protest can result in a decade in prison. It is true that totalitarianism, by its very definition, makes it impossible for citizens to think for themselves. And it's also true that most regular Russians are on board with the war right now. Russia is leading the charge in this conflict. The author, Jade McGlynn, is a research fellow at King's College London's Department of War Studies, and her new book bears that title. McGlynn uses data collected over the course of nine years, including dozens of ongoing in-depth conversations with Russian respondents, to demonstrate that the vast majority of Russians feel a connection to or investment in the war. McGlynn classifies Russians' feelings about the war into five types. Enthusiastic support, passive ritual support, loyal neutrality, indifference, and enthusiastic opposition. Very few people fall into the extremes. The Kremlin's harsh repression of anti-war protests, according to McGlynn, deters people from actively supporting the war. Why this is so is obvious. A fervent defense can quickly morph into harsh criticism of the regime for not doing enough to vanquish Ukraine. Most Russians, including those who enthusiastically shout the slogans fed to them but claim no political agency, passive ritual supporters, those who hold to the position, my country, right or wrong, loyal neutrals, and those who will acquiesce to anything as long as they feel they will be left alone, provide Putin's regime with support and cannon fodder. When the war reached Russian territory, I asked McGlynn if she thought these positions would change. She even speculated that some in the apathetic group might be swayed to join the loyal neutral camp. Having the war closer to home is terrifying to many. Fear is rarely a motivator for analytical thought. Political scientist Jeremy Morris, who also investigates Russian opinions of the war, calls this result, defensive consolidation. When under attack, it is natural to place blame on the one doing the attacking rather than on oneself, one's country, or one's leader. Russian propaganda has helped spread the idea that the Ukrainians were responsible for starting the conflict. Putin made an impromptu speech the morning of the drone attacks in Moscow at an unrelated event in the city, claiming that Ukraine, acting as a puppet of NATO, started a war in the Donbass in 2014, forcing Russia finally to intervene eight years later, that Russia has been hitting only strategically important military targets, and that Ukraine, now, was trying to escalate by attacking inside Russia in hope of provoking a reaction. This was completely false. Still, it squared with what Russian state television had been saying for a year prior. And the drones were hard proof that Ukraine had launched an attack inside Russia, as if Putin's claims had been true all along. This is a common structure in historical accounts. You might object that Putin has repeatedly denied the very existence of Ukraine. Yes, he did, and he referred to Ukraine as the regime in Kyiv, when discussing the drone attacks and the counter-offensive, which he called, the offensive. Yet another staple of totalitarian propaganda is the use of contradictions, antinomies, or pairs of beliefs that are incompatible with one another, 
were central to the great Russian sociologist Yuri Levada's theory on the Soviet totalitarian mentality. Contradictory statements commonly heard in the Soviet Union included, the state is always screwing us over, and, I'm proud to live in the greatest country on earth. Similar contradictions are evoked by the latest developments in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. In Shebekino, a Russian village near the border with Ukraine, civilians died on June 1st due to an apparent Ukrainian attack, and McGlynn said, but they are used to that. They are also understandably upset about the loss of innocent life. That will undoubtedly encourage them to back the military. But McGlynn told me that her regulars no longer bother with lengthy, geopolitical discussions, in which they typically tried to persuade her that Ukraine doesn't exist. She speculated that it was more difficult to argue this point, when you could be killed by Ukrainians who very much think they are Ukrainians. Discouragement of thought is the goal of contradictory and destabilizing propaganda. Together with fear, it helps keep people under totalitarian regimes from resisting. The state-controlled Russian media painted the attacks within Russia as both horrible and meaningless. Propagandists Roman Babayan and Margarita Samanyan, on one evening talk show, claimed that, the enemy, hoped incursions into Russian territory would destabilize Russian society and undermine support for the war. Samanyan explained the motivation. It's being done so that you will show scary footage. As in. So that we all become horrified, to frighten us, to make us stop supporting the goals and reasons for our special operation, to make us get scared and start stomping our feet, screaming, let's put everything the way it was so there won't be any more burning buildings in the Belgorod region. Photos published by Russian media outlets depicted enormous columns of black smoke rising from Shebekino apartment complexes. Babayan initially acknowledged the threat, but then quickly downplayed it. He claimed that only 70 warriors participated in the assault on Shebekino. To paraphrase, this is not a very serious threat. In their propaganda, the fighters were always, the enemy, or, they, and the words, Ukraine, and, Ukrainians, were never used because they simply don't exist. The men who claimed responsibility for the attacks in the Belgorod region are actually Russian citizens fighting on the side of the Ukrainian government, and they call themselves the Russian Volunteer Corps. Few people in Russia would have known that the attackers from Ukraine were actually Russians unless they were avid followers of war news via telegram channels. Members of the Russian Volunteer Corps are likely to have informed them that they are far-right nationalists who are fighting not just for an independent Ukraine but also for an ethnically homogenous Russia. Despite the fact that these Nazis are actually Russian, this is in keeping with Russian propaganda that labels Ukrainians as such. That propaganda and reality have any connection at all is irrelevant in Russia. Americans tend to think of Russian public opinion as operating similarly to American public opinion. The conventional wisdom holds that as more and more American households felt the effects of the Vietnam War, their support for the conflict waned. The publication of the Pentagon Papers, which revealed to Americans that their government had been lying to them about the war, is omitted from this account. The publication of the Pentagon Papers was pivotal because it systematically disseminated the documents and amplified the public's reaction to them. In the United States, we had the public space infrastructure to facilitate the free flow of ideas and information. Not in Russia. Russian households who have lost sons or husbands in the conflict are not represented in the media, either on screen or in print. Due to the lack of a public forum, Military deaths are mourned as individual tragedies rather than shared ones. The American public is aware of the extreme difficulty of organizing a protest in Russia. It only takes the most mild-mannered of public displays to send someone to jail. One such case is that of Sasha Skochelenko, a 32-year-old artist from St. Petersburg who has been held in pretrial detention for over a year on the alleged charge of spreading false information by altering supermarket price tags to include tiny notes on the siege of Mariupol. The cost of peaceful dissent, of thinking differently in a society so fragmented that fear and anger directed at its enemies, is something that many Americans underestimate. The mental toll of being alone in the face of war is too high to bear, even if you don't talk to anyone about your fears and uncertainties. Loyalty is not just more convenient. It may be the only solace available to families who have lost loved ones, have loved ones at the front, 
or whose towns have been devastated by the fighting. It is notoriously difficult to gauge public sentiment in totalitarian regimes. People aren't allowed to form opinions, and there is no public.